A true spiritual worship is a wondrous, beautiful thing. I'm so grateful to be a part of it this morning. As we come to the Word of God, I invite you to join me in the book of Genesis. In particular, the opening of Genesis chapter 12. We'll read there in a moment. There was a small boy who was consistently late coming home from school. And it was a worry to his parents. And they warned him repeatedly. And finally one day said, this is the last warning. And he said, you need to be home on time this afternoon, but again, uh, just like always, he arrived. In fact, he arrived later than ever, and his mother met him at the door. She didn't say anything, but then that night at dinner, they sat down together, and the boy looked at his plate, and there was just a slice of bread and a, a glass of water, and he looked over at his father's plate, and it was full, and Looked at his father, his father stayed silent. Boy was crushed. And his dad waited for sort of the impact to, to sink in. And, and then he, he reached over and took the boy's plate and placed it in front of himself. And he took his own full plate and, you know, with meat and potatoes and so forth and put it in front of the boy and then smiled at his son. And, and when that boy grew to be a man, he said, all my life I have known what God is like by what my father did that night. Well, family, when it is done right, can be a powerful thing. I wonder if we appreciate the importance of families in the plan of God for the world. In the beginning, when God created man, mankind, and man in particular, he very quickly saw that it was not good for the man to be alone, and so he created woman. And thus he created family. Now I want you to notice in that family, there was a man and there was a woman. There was Adam, and there was Eve. Eventually, they were blessed with children. This is the definition of family from the beginning. And the world can give you all kinds of other definitions, but I want you to see the Bible's definition. Adam and Eve had children, and, and they were given charge of a uh, of being fruitful and, and multiplying and, and taking care of what God asked them to tend, the beautiful place that he gave them, the garden. And of course, as we are familiar with the story, we, we know that things didn't exactly work out perfectly well in the garden, that man was rebellious, sinful, and they were tossed out of that perfect environment. You can read all about that and what happened exactly in Genesis 1, 2, and 3. Those chapters close with God placing curses on, on mankind as a result of their sin and rebellion. And then as you read on through chapters 4, really up through chapter 11 of Genesis, you see these curses and you see man's sin continue and, and even develop more through the centuries of history. And you see murder and bloodshed and you see the earth destroyed in a flood. And you see the descendants of Noah continue even after that great punishment to sin at the Tower of Babel where they strive to make a name for themselves in chapter 11. And so then in chapter 11, the focus of the Bible narrows back down to one family. It's the family of a man named Terah. 
Terah and his family live in ancient Mesopotamia in a great and famous city called Ur. And I want us to look at a couple of verses before we get to chapter 12 um, that close out chapter 11. If you look beginning at verse 27 of Genesis 11, notice what's said about this family. Now these are the generations of Terah. Terah fathered Abram, Nahor, and Haran, and Haran fathered Lot. Haran died in the presence of his father Terah in the land of his kindred in Ur of the Chaldeans. And Abram and Nahor took wives. The name of Abram's wife was Sarai. And the name of Nahor's wife Milcah, the daughter of Haran, the father of Milcah and Iscah. Now Sarai was barren. She had no child. Terah took Abram his son, and Lot the son of Haran his grandson, and Sarai his daughter-in-law, his son Abram's wife, and they went forth together from Ur of the Chaldeans to go into the land of Canaan. But when they came to Haran, they settled there. The days of Terah were 205 years, and Terah died in Haran. So we have this family that God has chosen to work with. They've moved from Ur, that great city, to this other city, Haran, which is sort of halfway between Mesopotamia and Canaan. And they settle in this place. If you look at this family, it's a family that really has nothing to offer if God is looking to start over again in his project for the world. Now, why do I say that? Because Sarai, the wife of Abram, is barren. She's not able to have children. So surely this is not the family that God would choose to start over with, right? Well, actually, that's not right. I think we need to learn, as we think today about the importance of families and the plan of God, that God does not look for families or people with great potential. He looks instead for families and people of great faith. Physically, the family of Terah and Abraham had no potential, but they did have faith, and that God can use. That's actually what he's looking for. So sometimes we might disparage our families uh, in our minds. You know, we might think God can't use us, can't use me, can't use my family, look at all our problems. We don't have any outstanding talent. We've struggled, we make mistakes, we're, we're sinners. But God is not looking for potential. We often talk in terms of potential, but God is not looking for potential. He's looking for faith. He, he is looking for people who will hear and then do. He has more than enough potential in himself for all he needs to accomplish in this world. Don't buy the lie that God can't use you or your family in his plan. He most certainly can. So we come to chapter 12 and these incredible first three verses of chapter 12. It's hard to overstate how important they are really, in, in the Bible as a whole, as well as in human history and, and in our lives. Because here is where God's plan to redeem man really begins to take shape, begins to be revealed. Um, the first 11 chapters of Genesis, it's full of sin and, and curse and death and destruction. But in chapter 12, verse 1, 
things begin to turn, and it turns on God's relationship with a family. There's a great commentary on Genesis by Derek Kidner, and he makes a comment here that I want to quote as he reflects on on the opening of Genesis 12. He says, quoting him, he says, the history of redemption, like that of creation, begins with God speaking. Think about that. Think back to Genesis 1. The account of the creation of the world. How does that begin? It begins, and God said. Right? Let there be light. And on and on it goes throughout creation week. God speaks and things happen. Well, look here at Genesis 12. How does it begin? Now the Lord spoke to Abram. We're going to find as we look at these three verses that it's all about God. It's all about God. God has chosen to redeem mankind from their sin. He's going to offer grace and mercy and forgiveness to people. In fact, to all people. Not just to this family. Not just to Abram. But to all people. How is he going to do that? At least initially through a family. The family of Abraham. God chooses to reveal his grace in a particular family that can pass it on to other families. So right here, God shows us how important families are to his plan. He has entrusted his plan of salvation to families. And so he puts his stamp of approval on on families, on marriage, on children. Don't let anybody disparage what God has approved. There's an awful lot of disparaging and corruption of families in our world, and we need to stand against that. So God decides to reveal himself in and through a family. It's a family that has its problems. If you've read the story, you know Here, they're immobilized. Did you notice back chapter 11, verse 30, Sarah is unable to have children. And then in uh, verse 32 of chapter 11, the family has settled. They've settled in this city, Haran. It's far from the land of Canaan, where God has sent them. In You go over into chapter 12 then, beginning at verse 4 and and reading further, you see that this this family responds to God's call. They pick up and they move. Um, They leave Haran. They, They head out for a land that God will show them, which we come to find out is the land of Canaan. So what happens between the end of chapter 11, where you have an immobilized family, And then the rest of chapter 12, beginning in verse 4, where you have a family on the move to where God has called them. Well, like we said, God speaks. In verses 1, 2, and 3 of chapter 12. Now the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you, And I will make of you a great nation, and I will bless you and make your name great so that you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and him who dishonors you, I will curse. And in you, all the families of the earth shall be blessed. A couple of things I just want to notice quickly with you in these very important three verses. First, I want you to notice... How many times the pronoun I is used in this text? There's three verses, but five times in those three verses we have the pronoun I. God is speaking. This is really about God and his initiative. So he says, go to the land I will show you. 
I will make you a great nation. I will bless you. I will bless those who bless you. I will curse those who curse you. See, I think what we tend to do as we study these great stories, and we've been studying them in Bible class, but I think what we tend to do is we, like with this story, we, we focus on Abraham. But the story is really about God. And, and it's about what God is going to do. God's the hero of the story, not Abraham. Never forget that about the Bible as you read it. God is the hero. Jesus is the hero. Abraham and his like will always disappoint us at some point. God never will. The second thing, notice the importance here of the word to bless in these three verses. Again, it's used five times in this short passage. I will bless you. You will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you. And in you all the families of the earth shall be blessed. This God who speaks to Abraham is interested in blessing people. In fact, he's interested in blessing all people. Not just Abraham and his family, but all. He has the best interest of all people at heart. Since Genesis chapter 1, you know, there's, there's been a lot of cursing going on throughout these stories. Uh, but from chapter 12 on, the blessings begin to develop and to flow. And so when God wanted to, uh, to bless the world, when he decided to sort of start over and to bless the world, he chose a family to start with and, to, and through whom to channel his blessings to all people. The family is so important in God's plan. And, and as we try and apply this to our families today, let's just mention a few more things that come out of these verses. First, notice all the blessings that God offers to Abraham and his family. They are conditional upon their obedience. It's always been the way God has worked among people, and it always will be. So God says, I will give you land, but first you have to leave where you are. You have to leave home. You have to leave your extended family. You have to leave your place in Haran. Now, Abraham does that, and he had to do it in order to get the blessing that God wanted to give. When we think about God using our families to accomplish his purpose in this world, we have to realize there are some conditions he lays out in the Bible that we have to meet. Is that works righteousness? No, it's not. What it is is faithfulness faithfulness. Then second, Abraham and his family have some major barriers that they have to overcome before they receive the blessing of God. Again, they have to make a big move. Uh, there was the fact that also as a barrier, there's, a, there's the fact that Sarah at this point is not able to, to bear children. You know, how do you start a nation full of people when the supposed mother of the nation is barren. That's a barrier. And there are many other obstacles that come as they make their way toward God's purpose. Point being, God wants to use our families, but we have to realize there will be bumps in the road. There will be setbacks and barriers to overcome. And you know, some of them will be major ones. Some will be minor, but they will be there nonetheless. It's not as if he just gives us a perfectly level and smooth path. Third, did you notice 
that God is the one who is going to establish Abraham's name. He promises him that, that he will make his name great. That is a huge contrast to just one chapter before. If you go back one chapter to chapter 11, the story of the Tower of Babel, the people there, do you remember what they were so eager to do to make a name for themselves? That was really the essence of their sin there. And so God defeats them. He confuses their languages. Sometimes I think our families can get caught up in the game of trying to make a name for ourselves. Whether it is by pursuing worldliness and riches, or maybe putting up a show of righteousness that's really not genuine, or whatever it might be, sometimes we can forget that God is the one who establishes our name. The scripture says over in uh, the New Testament in 1 Peter, remember these words that the apostle wrote, humble yourselves therefore under the mighty hand of God and at the right time he will exalt you. Fourth, God promises his protection to Abraham's family through this whole process. He says, I will curse those who curse you. Now, God is, is, is certainly asking for a high degree of faith and commitment from this family. But as always, he, he gives so much more in return. Wouldn't you love to be under the protection of God? Wouldn't you love to have God standing behind you when the bully comes against you? Well, you can have that. We can all have that. God promises protection to families of faith. Now, does that mean he will build a protective hedge around us and we will never suffer? No. That's not what it means. Go read the book of Job to see the illustration of this. But he will not allow a faithful family, a faithful person, to be cursed. He will curse those who curse you. Did you know that Satan and all his allies cannot destroy a faithful family? He has no power against a faithful person. Why? Because of God's protection. That is his promise. And the last thing, let's, let's sort of end where we began in these verses. And that is that it, it is through a family that God's blessing is given to mankind. When God wanted to bless the world again, he chose a family. When he wanted later on to send his only begotten son into the world, he chose a family. He chose a mother, a godly mother, Mary. He chose a good man to be an earthly father to his only begotten son, Joseph. Again, just like in the beginning, a man and a woman. He chose then an extended family, a clan, a tribe, Judah. He chose a nation, Israel. So how important is family to God? When God comes back, when, when Jesus returns, he's going to be looking for a family. A church, yes. The church is the family of God. But you know full well what a church is made up of. Families. They are of all shapes and sizes. 
Some families are a single person. Now we often, we think of family, we think of mom, dad, and the kids. But sometimes it's a single person. Sometimes it's a couple. Sometimes children are involved. God works through families. And God still calls families, individual families, to be dispensers of his grace and mercy to this world. I just want to assert this morning that God has a plan and purpose for your family. When he comes back, he is going to be looking for a faithful family. That is a family who has heard and done and who has blessed others. Never forget the importance of your family, whatever shape or size it is, in the plan of God. It is essential. And today as we close, we get ready to sing again together. If you have never been added to the family of God, if you've never obeyed the gospel of Jesus, um, believing on him as the son of God and, and submitting yourself to him, obeying him in all things, we invite you today to... Uh, if you'll be baptized into Christ today, God will add you to his family, the church. And, and if you need the prayers of this church, the help of this church, please let us know what the nature of that help is that you need and what we can do to be a blessing. That's what we want to be about. So today, if you need to come before us for, for, for some reason, we offer you these moments as we stand together and we sing this song.